More than 40% of doctors in Ontario are female. But according to new research, they don't occupy that same proportion of leadership roles, nor is there pay equity between male and female physicians. With us for more, we're joined from Cape Cod, Massachusetts by Sarah Kaplan. She's director of the Institute for Gender and the Economy and professor of strategic management at the Rotman School of Management at the University of Toronto. And back here in the provincial capital at Sunnybrook Hospital, Dr. Fahima Dosa, general surgery resident at the University of Toronto and in the west end of the provincial capital, Robin Doolittle, investigative reporter with the Globe and Mail. And it's great to have you three on our program today. Dr. Dosa, I think for the first time with you, so thank you very much for joining us. Let's just get a little of the background in place before we look at this in depth. And uh, that is, Robin, you and your colleague Chen Wong, what brought you to this story in the first place? Yeah, so throughout 2021, uh, Chen and I and The Globe have been um, rolling out this series called The Power Gap, where we have been looking at gender inequities in various professions. We've done Corporate Canada um, uh, with my colleague Tavia Grant, uh, law, academia, the public sector. And the last pillar that we wanted to look at was medicine, which is a sector, of course, that has never been so visible to so many people. Um, and, you know, throughout the rest of the series, we've been looking at pay specifically, but because of the complicated way that doctors are compensated, uh, we weren't able to do that. What we did was we looked at the ratio of men and women in different leadership positions in medicine. So we took the 10 largest hospitals that had the largest budgets in Ontario, we got their latest organizational charts, and we looked at the breakdown of physicians at different points. So research jobs, um, department chiefs, program directors, executives, and presidents. And I gather, even though Hamilton Health Sciences would be in the top 10, they are not included in this analysis. Do you want to give us sort of the very fast reason why? Uh, and Hamilton. I mean, we we went to the uh, the government body that that has um, tracks data on this and uh, and budgets, and they sent us the ten largest hospital corporations uh, by budget in the in the province. So we just used their list. Okay, let's look at some. We would have loved to do everybody, but it just it wasn't possible because we had to manually research each of these hundreds of data points, which is a big part of what we've been trying to expose with this series, is that we shouldn't have to do that. This information should be out there. For sure. Okay, let's take a look at, Sheldon, if you wouldn't mind, let's bring this graphic up and we'll go through this. And for those listening on podcast, uh, I'll just go into this in some depth here so everybody can see what's what. 67% of hospital corporation presidents in the province of Ontario are men. 33% are women. Women occupied 54% of positions at the executive level and 32% of department chiefs, 29% of division heads, and 23% of research institute leadership are women. Uh, the, that's a long way from 50-50, as I don't have to uh, tell anybody because my math is uh, bad, but it's not that bad. Robin, what would you argue, though, to somebody who might say, uh, no, it's not 50-50, but it's not horrible either? Uh, I mean, I think it is pretty bad. The executive level is really interesting because in that category, you can see that there actually are more women. There's 54%. What is key is uh, at the executive level, uh, many of those people, perhaps most, are not uh, physicians. They're put in that role because of experience in the business sector or other areas of expertise. In the medical leadership pipeline, uh, with department chiefs and division heads, women make up less than a third of leadership roles, and in those prestigious research positions, less than a quarter. And I think what's really important to remember is that women and men have been graduating from medical school at about the same rate for two decades. There are going to be more women doctors in this country than men by the end of this decade. And yet women are, are really far behind in, in terms of the, of the leadership pipeline. Well, we have one of them here, and I'd like to know what she thinks uh, at the beginning of what you hope, I presume, will be a long career in the medical field. What do you think, Dr. Dosa, when you see these numbers? Yeah, I mean, I think it reflects the lived experience that I see as I go through my medical training. You know, often we hear the argument that this is just a pipeline issue and things will get better over time. Um, but if we reflect on the specialties that are already predominantly women, we see that that's not actually what's happening. I think if we look at obstetrics and gynecology, it's a great example of that. 
predominantly women. Uh, women are in the majority and have been for a very long time. But even within that specialty, if you look at who's occupying the leadership positions throughout the country, it's still heavily, heavily dominated by men. So I don't think it's necessarily a pipeline issue. I don't think that we can just assume that things are going to get better on their own over time. Well, let me make this assumption. My assumption is that the people watching or listening to this suspect that you and your male counterparts earn the same. Do you? Uh, I'd love to say that women in medicine and in surgery, which is what I practice, make the same amount as their male counterparts. Unfortunately, we have evidence that that's not the case. Uh, we've studied that specific question here in Ontario, where physicians are primarily paid on a fee-for-service basis, meaning you get paid for the procedures that you do in surgery. And it sounds like, in theory, it should be an equitable system. And unfortunately, we've shown here in Ontario, female surgeons make about 25% less than their male counterparts. Now, how is that possible? If you're both paid the same amount for the same service, how can you be making so much less? Yeah, I, obviously, if we're doing the same service, we get paid the same amount. Uh, so really, the mechanism behind this is the idea that we're not doing the same service, that for whatever reason, women are more often doing the less lucrative procedures in surgery and probably practicing that way throughout medicine, not just in surgery. Um, our data show that the more remunerative a procedure becomes, the fewer and fewer women you see doing that procedure. And I don't think that's a coincidence. I don't think women are choosing to do the procedures that make or provide less uh, income. Uh, we have to believe that there is some kind of systemic bias that's driving this. Okay, here's our systemic bias expert now, Sarah Kaplan, who we bring into the conversation. Do we assume, Sarah Kaplan, that for whatever reason, uh, the province of Ontario and or the Ontario Medical Association, which after all negotiates these fees, do we assume that they are putting a greater importance on the procedures mostly done by men as opposed to by women? Is that what's happening? I think that's a really interesting hypothesis and one that it, it could be true that because of the historical leadership gap that Robin already pointed out, that the people who are in power who are negotiating these rates are negotiating rates for the procedures that, th that they do. I think the other reason, though, really has to do much more with referrals. So, for example, in surgery, surgeons don't do procedures without being referred uh, a patient from a, another doctor. And often those referrals are biased. There's plenty of research to show that, in fact, women are getting referrals for the lower uh, remunerating procedures than men are. And so that accumulates over time because if you're not getting the referral to do the, the procedure that pays more, you're not going to be able to do that procedure. Dr. Dosa, I presume you are a member of the Ontario Medical Association now. Do you think they know yeah. about this issue that we've just identified? Yes, I think they do. I think they've published their own research corroborating all of this, uh, showing that there is a gender pay gap across all medical specialties in the province. Um, and I think they do now know that some of this is rooted in referral bias. Uh, we recently did a study, our group here, uh, showing that that was certainly driving a fair amount of the gender pay gap. So the data are out there, and now it's just a matter of trying to address them and find solutions to this issue. Well, that's the question, isn't it? Do you think they're adequately seized of this issue to want to do something about it? Yes, I think, in fact, the time is now. Um, I think that all the data are out there. Uh, if there is going to be change, this is the time. And I actually think that the pandemic... Uh, opens up a window of opportunity. We've seen through the pandemic a number of ways in which our healthcare system has deficiencies. Uh, and it really gives us the opportunity to try and address numerous issues, uh, those being to provide better, more timely and equitable care for patients, but also how to restructure our healthcare system to make sure physicians are treated equitably as well. Sarah, let's hit on one really quite fascinating finding here, which is that health outcomes and success rates of procedures, the system measures this stuff, and they measure it when these procedures are done by male as opposed to female surgeons and or doctors. What have we learned about the outcomes depending on gender? Well, this is a very shocking new finding that's just out that's been making the, the rounds amongst the uh, surgeons around Toronto because I've received many calls uh, asking for advice on how to deal with this, but the research has shown that when 
uh, women uh, are, have uh, an operation from a surgeon who is male, they are 15% more likely to have negative outcomes and 32% more likely to die than if their surgeon is a woman. And that difference doesn't exist for male patients. So there's no difference between a female and a male surgeon for a male patient. So this is the kind of evidence that's suggesting that you know these biases, the lack of access to these uh, professions is creating real health inequities. And we know those health inequities go much beyond even just the surgical result, especially if you look at it intersectionally. So we know, for example, black women are much more likely to die in childbirth, that black people's pain is much less likely to be treated. So we can think about this uh, along multiple dimensions and almost all the research suggests that there are these biased outcomes uh, when you start to look at differences be between in issues of gender, race, or other any idea, sir, what explains all that? <laughs> well, of course, that's a long story, Steve, that you and I have been engaged in over uh, numerous different appearances. And what I would say is there are many different mechanisms, but I believe that one of the most important mechanisms that is really contributing to this inequity right now is the myth of meritocracy. Uh, this idea that somehow the women and the men who rise up to these positions of power that uh, Robin was talking about uh, somehow are it's only a purely meritorious system and that if women surgeons were better, they would get better referrals. Somehow that's the idea. But we know from multiple different studies across many different professions, including sciences and medicine, that, the, that meritocracy really is a myth, that we know that uh, women have to be twice as qualified or have much more experience to be considered to have the same level of quality as a male counterpart. And plenty of research on quotas and affirmative action basically demonstrate that your quality actually goes up when you put those in place because it forces you to look more broadly, find the talent where it resides. And the real challenge is that you know when you actually put in a real meritocracy through these quotas and affirmative action, the people who fall out tend to be the people who've been historically advantaged by that system, who are the the white men. Um, and so that's, to, to counteract this system, you're gonna have to deal with those imbalances that exist. My mother always used to say, the women always have to be twice as good as the men, and fortunately, that's not that tough to do. But that's another story for another day. Robin, let me get you back in here. Can you share some of the stories from the um, women that you talked to for your series that might put a little more sort of facts on the ground for the, uh, about this for us. For sure, and I think that it's important to listen to those stories because while you can crunch all the data you want and produce reports that show statistics and percentages, it's really the anecdotal stories that I think provide a lot of context. Uh, just to return quickly to the, the fee for service, like this is a, a prime example. Um, the bias that's happening right now is not, oh, she's a woman, we're going to pay her less, right? It's more nuanced than that. And that's why it's so difficult to get at. So we interviewed dozens of female physicians from across the country, and they all told very similar stories, that they were from medical school pushed into specialties that pay less, that when they are in the operating room, um, they are given fewer opportunities to learn, to, to push themselves, to take risks than their male counterparts. And these things slowly compound throughout a career. Uh, it gives them uh, less ability to, um, to take on higher paying specialties uh, and procedures. And, and I think that that's what's really key. There was this one thing that I found that um, just told the whole story to me there, and I hope I'm not misstating this, but... Um, the the fee to make an incision on a vulva is half of the fee to make an incision on a scrotum. Like this is the kind of stuff that is built into this system. So um, when it comes to the actual experiences of female physicians, what I heard a lot was that there is just this very entrenched bias in society where people view men as doctors and women as nurses. And I heard many stories of female physicians sitting down with patients and you know doing a consultation and the patient at the end going, so when is my doctor coming? When is my doctor coming in? Or patients um, getting a referral for a female surgeon and, and going back and saying, I don't want a, a woman to do this. Like this is the kind of stuff that 
that we're all battling against and trying to rewire society because you know, this stuff is ingrained from a very young age. Robin, having said that, uh, during COVID, I can't recall a time when I've interviewed more male nurses and female doctors than over the past year and a half, two years. And yet you think this, this image of the healthcare system persists where the man is the doctor and the woman is the nurse? I do. And actually, I would, um, I haven't, you know, done a tally of your guests, but I can say as someone who does watch the media a lot that actually I think there has been a disproportionate number of doctors and experts speaking on COVID that are men than women. When some of the predominant experts in this field um, are uh, are women. Um, and uh, I think that that's, that's actually a great example of where you've really seen this. And certainly through my reporting, not just in the Power Gap series, but I've done a lot of reporting on COVID as well, um, those women experts will are, are discussing this, actually. Like, this is, if, if they're watching right now, they're probably going... <laughs> well, I'm going to try not to sound defensive when I ask this next question, but the fact is we care about this and we track this stuff pretty carefully. And I know we routinely are 50-50 male-female when it comes to guests on this program. And I think it's the highest percentage of female guests of any program in North America, any current affairs program in North America, because we've made the commitment to do that. And so, so let's I, talk about that for a second, because sure. that works then. Ratios, uh, counting, that's what has to happen here. When we talk about how do we make improvements in this area, um, TVO has got it together and is making a count of this and is, and is checking. And I think that that's something that not just in medicine, but employers across the board have to start doing. You have to start counting this stuff. And that's what the Power Gap series has been trying to do, is actually put numbers to these to these. Um, position so that the number of medical chiefs in hospitals is 32 percent women the number of department heads is something like 28 percent women or 29 percent women if you can't if you don't count it you're not going to get better so kudos to tvo for counting no i'm not looking for kudos but i just no I, no, no I, i'm giving you kudos we <laughs> okay, okay. But I do want to take that example that, that you just put on the record, and I want to go to Sarah on this, which is to say that if the people who are running Ontario medical schools, or if the people who are running the hospitals, or if the heads of surgeries were more often women than men, do you suspect there would be a difference in the kind of shunting of women doctors into fields that traditionally pay them less? Is there any reason to believe that would happen? Well, there's some reason to believe that that would happen just because there may be a level of awareness. Um, but I think it has to be more than that, because if you put women into positions of power in a traditionally patriarchal system, they're going to replicate some of those existing systems. So we need to do the kinds of things that Robin is talking about, whether the leader is a woman or a man. And also to think about that, even though counting is incredibly important because it leads to accountability, counting isn't enough. It's not enough to just put a woman doctor or surgeon in a particular situation if the situation is very hostile. If, for example, they don't get the opportunities that Robin was talking about to actually try out their skills. So we need to count, but we also need to think about the organizational cultures that are leading uh, women to uh, be sidelined from many of the higher uh, paying areas or higher paying procedures. So it's both counting, but it's also creating that more inclusive culture. Okay, that takes me to Dr. Dosa now. And Dr. Dosa, you have to believe me when I say I'm really not trying to get you in trouble when I ask you this question. However, comma, as you look around the, the world you inhabit, I don't know if you're only exclusively at Sunnybrook or if you, if you practice elsewhere as well, but are the people who are in positions of leadership where you work, are they mostly male? Are they mostly female? If they are mostly female, uh, are they perpetuating this problem, or can you tell if they're changing this problem? Take that on, if you would. Yeah, so, I mean, I moved through a lot of hospitals in Toronto, um, and I've seen uh, leadership at a number of places. I think I'm fortunate in general surgery in Toronto, at the University of Toronto, uh, that there are several number, several women in leadership positions. Um, and they, I mean, it's important to have those role models. I think at the hospital level, there's still work to be done. Um, but certainly, I, I think that the situation that we have here at the University of Toronto is not necessarily reflective of what we see across the country or even across the province. Um, I think Toronto and the academic program here in medicine is very unique in a lot of ways, and that might be one of them. 
Um, and I agree with Sarah in that, you know, we can't just count numbers. We actually need to change the entire environment. Because uh, what we do know is that, you know, if women come into these positions and act stereotypically female, uh, they're looked down upon, they're thought to be incompetent in their positions. If women come into these leadership positions and they act like men, uh, they're also uh, looked down upon, they're thought uh, to be too aggressive, too bossy. And so just putting women in these academic positions or counting the number of women in leadership is not enough. I think we really need greater change than that. Robin, let me try this with you, because I, I have heard this from people who've had interactions in the healthcare system. And the, the thesis goes something like this. Of course women are paid less than men. If they're GPs, they work many hours fewer than men because they want to have more balanced lives than their male counterparts. They don't want to work 80 hours a week and never see their families and never be able to have interactions with their parents or their kids. And that's why they're paid less. How much truth is there in that? I think this is such an important thing to discuss and that we've been hearing throughout doing this reporting. Um, the goal here is not that everyone should be working 100 hours a week, or maybe it is. It's really up to, to the individual person, right? And I think that sometimes we conflate these conversations as, oh, if only women you know, definitely worked more, this would be solved. And maybe men don't want to work as much either, right? Like this is kind of a shift that's happening with COVID as people are reevaluating what they want in life. I think the big thing is what's the preference, right? Like what, if someone wants to work part-time, that's great. If they want to work a hundred hours a week, that's great. We know that women are being pushed into these lower paying specialties, are making less money, are securing less secure, um, lucrative positions and leadership positions, not just because they gosh darn don't want to work that much, right? And that's really what this is about. So there is certainly a huge number of people, I think, that that's, you know say what you were saying. I think what was really interesting to me doing this research, um, Dr. Dosa has is like the premier researcher on this right now, and. Uh, part of what we told in those stories was the pushback that she and her colleagues received in trying to even get this, this research published in medical journals because some of the reviewers were writing back, well, probably women are working less because they don't work as, they're getting paid less because they don't want to work as much, which is no place in a review for a scientific journal. Like the defensiveness that people have when they say that, I think is just a, an example of how hard it is to overcome this. Dr. Dosa, you want to talk about that pushback for a moment? Sure. I, I think it, there are a few notes coming back to your last point that are important to make. Um, the first one being that there are actually more men in medicine who have families than there are women. And um, so part of fixing this issue is also coming to terms to have the opportunity uh, to play a role in their families as well. And, and that this shouldn't only be looked at as the role of women in medicine. Uh, coming back to that idea that women make less because they work less, we actually tried to address that specific issue in our work. And what we looked at was how much women were making for the time they spent working. To take out this idea that women just make less because they work less, and we looked at how much they were making for every hour they spent operating. And even then, they make less money than do men. And, and as Robin said, this work was very, very challenging to get published, as have our subsequent projects related to this issue. And, you know, I think people want to believe that they're not biased and that the systems that they work in are unbiased and that they got to where they are through a completely meritocratic system. And, and so it's easy to get defensive and it's easy to look for reasons why these data can't be true. Uh, but we've looked at it a million ways. We're not the only ones to show these results. And I think we show time and time again that this is an issue. And we're all estimating the same magnitude of the issue. And so it's hard not to believe the data. Okay, here's my smart aleck question now for Sarah Kaplan. And that is, you know, the public right now has a finite number of things that they can care about because, of course, they've been dealing with COVID for two years. And, and you know, people have had just about enough. You you have all identified an issue here that is a real issue, uh, but it's a real issue for people, uh, most of whom are really well paid when you consider everybody else in society. Which leads to the question, Sarah, now how much should people really give a damn about this? Well, I think they should care a lot because 
what it means to not have women's voice represented or the voices of people of color represented in medicine means that, first of all, the outcomes that we talked about, women and people of color, which is now, you know, the vast majority of people in our society are actually not getting the level of care they should be getting simply because of the biases that have built been built into the system so that they don't have the people caring for them who can really understand and their issues and treat them with respect. So everyone should care because the health system is worse for it and their outcomes are uh, worse for it. And I think people should also care because medicine is uh, kind of a flag bearer for a lot of other industries. And this this is a story that plays out in literally every industry that I have ever studied. This exact issue plays out. It's the same with boards of directors. And if you don't have those people in positions of power, which has been what's so powerful about Robin's reporting, you don't get decisions that fairly consider everyone in society. So I think we should all be pretty seriously uh, worried about these findings that Dr. Dosa and that Robin have, have put forward. Robin, can I get you on that as well? I mean, even even the, the, the women in the healthcare system who are doctors who feel the least powerful, they're still making six-figure salaries. So, okay, hit me with your best shot. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you should get paid what you earn. That's just... The, I mean, or what you deserve. Um, that's like some pretty basic stuff. I think uh, I've certainly heard that. Particularly, we were doing our uh, in our in our legal analysis, looking at law firms, um, and women were uh, equity partners were making twenty five percent of what their male counterparts were making. And in that case, we actually had dollar amounts, and it was you know north of three hundred thousand dollars difference. And people are saying, who cares? When you think of women who are in the the top of their field in professions that are the most respected by society um, uh, or among the most respected in society. And they can't do it. They can't get equity. They can't uh, get an equal voice. That's really concerning. And, um, you know, you mentioned it off the top when you were talking to Sarah that, uh, you know, there's so much stuff going on right now. Can we focus on this? I'm not going to lie. When we were rolling out this series, that was something that really weighed on on our minds, and particularly my mind. That what's the right time to to ask people to care about um, gender equity in the workforce when there is no workforce? This was the beginning of COVID, and you know, ultimately, we thought actually this is the perfect time because we are reevaluating everything about how we live right now. We are reevaluating our relationship with work and our and, and the role that work plays in our lives. And when we build back, this is the moment that we can address so many of these things because we're going to have to overhaul any everything anyway. Uh, in our last thirty seconds, Dr. Dosa, this is all part of build back better for you. Is that right? <laughs> Well, I think so. And I, I want to move away from the idea of this being only about money. Uh, and I think importantly, there is a piece here to create better care for patients. You know, if we're constantly sending patients to the white male physician, uh, there's probably a whole host of other physicians who can see the patient more quickly and, as data would show, may even provide better care for that patient. Um, so I think we need to move away from the idea of long wait times for physicians who simply uh, harbor the or mental image of what a physician should look like. Robin Doolittle, Dr. Fahima Dosa, Sarah Kaplan, good of all three of you to spend so much time with us on TVO tonight. Many thanks. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.